<laughs> hello to hello to everyone who's joining our Instagram uh, live, Jason Deary and Vivian Mayer. That's me. And you are in Vivian Art Gallery in Inglewood, Calgary, um, for our live celebration of the opening of what is truly an amazing exhibition of all new paintings by Jason Deary. Title of the show, Three-Legged Dog. We'll get into that. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know Jason, I'll just say a few words about him. Jason um, was raised mostly in Windsor, Ontario, did his uh, BFA at the University of Windsor. He actually did a work study program 2011-12 um, at the Bant Center, very close to home here, and then ended up spending a couple of years in Calgary before returning to Ontario and doing his Master's of Fine Art at the Ontario College of Art and Design University. Um, I think those are really important years for you, Jason, but let's get into that in a minute. For sure. Um, for you people joining us, thank you for joining us. Please um, grab yourself a beverage of your choice because we just want to acknowledge that um, for health reasons, of course, public health safety, we can't have Jason here. I would love to have Jason here and celebrate this work with him in person. But in the absence of that, Jason, congratulations on Thank what you. is, I believe, two solid years of work and incredible, incredible paintings. I'm so proud to have them in the gallery. Thank you very much. You are welcome. So cheers to you, my man. Cheers. Mm. So how many people do we have with us, Mika? Awesome. Okay, so let's move on. Um, Jason's in Toronto. Um, I'm here in Calgary, and we've got these beautiful paintings that he made in his studio in, in uh, Toronto. And we're going to start with this wall because this collection of smaller works gives us an opportunity to uh, talk about some things I want to touch on. The uh, process that Jason uses in making these works, the, um, some of the repetitive motifs and some of the images that he's using. And ultimately that'll lead us into um, just the overall content of the show. So we're gonna start here and then we're gonna slowly move around the space so that people who are watching the live can get a great opportunity to really see these works up close. We're not gonna wait for question period till the end. So please feel free to join right in and send your questions along when they come to you. We'd love to have you be part of our conversation. So maybe, um, Jason, if you don't mind, could you start by talking about, um, well, let's start by talking about Calgary, because why not? Sure. Um, so one of these images is the Enoch House. Mm -hmm. Two of the images, the um, Home and Away piece, which is the yellow, Yep. house with the with the collage elements on top and then the silk screen uh black and white is also the Enoch house can you talk a bit about that image sure um yeah so you know there's a lot of silk screen images running through this exhibition uh there's five images that come up again and again in whole or in part uh and that is certainly uh one of them that makes um i think second to the dog maybe the most frequent appearances in the exhibition um, so that house is a file photo of that house when it was in its glory. Um, and when I lived in the city, it was all, you know, boarded up, run down, fenced off. Uh, but I found myself, you know, really drawn to it. I'd pass by it at night on bike rides or runs, uh, when I was out and about. And, you know, when I was living in Alberta, um, I think I was a little bit homesick at times. And I had this weird attachment to this house in, it sort of reminded me of home a little bit, um, it reminded me of, you know, kind of the boarded up houses in Windsor and Detroit. Uh, I think Detroit is more known for the prevalence of them. Uh, but, you know, Windsor had its share as well. Um, and it also felt really out of place from what I knew about Calgary. Um, so this sort of like lone house kind of in the middle of nowhere, um, boarded up and well past its prime, but sort of still standing tall um, was something I was really drawn to. And I think in 2011, I was doing some drawings of it. Um, 
and having an exhibition in Calgary felt like a really good time to return to it again. That was your exhibition at Avalanche, I believe. Uh, that those series of drawings, I think, predated that exhibition. Actually, I think I was working on them when I was out in Banff. So ah. um, even even a few years before that. So yeah, it's like I've had this. I guess it's a decade now. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been into this house, uh, so it was like, okay, well, I really got to kind of you know get it out there now. Well, and for people in Calgary, they probably know this house. It was right right near the Stampede grounds, and in 2019, it sadly burnt to the ground. Yep. Um, because I believe it was like the oldest standing house in the city at that time. Um, because some squatters you know, lit a fire inside of it to stay warm. Um, yep. Kind of can't blame them. But at the same time, it really sad that the house got lost to fire. Um, that was in 2019. Um, while we're talking about this house and mm -hmm. this, this piece is called Home and Away, right? Yep. Um, which you were alluding to talking about the reminiscing of sort of the, the Windsor, Detroit area when you were here in Alberta. Was that the mm -hmm. first time that you sort of were living away from home as a single man? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, you know, like I lived, uh, had some, you know, apartments and stuff in Windsor that I was on my own in, but, you know, I was in my hometown, so it was pretty familiar. So that was certainly... Uh, the furthest away I had been from home and then also being by myself as well. So certainly, yeah. Um, so pretty formative time for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it was that period sort of after undergrad. Um, didn't quite know what I was doing and, you know, found myself out, out west. And, you know, when, when I got the role at the BAM Center and stuff, everything kind of fell into place. Um, and that was a super, super, super important time for me. Um, but that sort of mid-20s uh, felt really important. And... Uh, you know, having an exhibition in Calgary, I wanted to pay homage to some of those things. Mm -hmm. And thank you for doing that. And we're so excited to have your exhibition in Calgary. I'm going to get Mika to um, sort of wander around the pieces yep. so that people can see some of the other ones. Can you talk a little bit, um, would this be a good time to talk a little bit about your process in these pieces? Like window that she's, that she's pointing at right now, how is that made? Uh, so that one's a silk screen, um, silk screen acrylic over acrylic. So <clears throat> um, the the paintings are all they're all acrylic on linen or canvas, uh, and then with some various methods put into place. So I was doing some hand pulled silk screens um, of both found and images I took, and then also acrylic paint and acrylic collage are all kind of rolled into one. Uh, this window in particular, I think, is a little bit more uh, minimal of approach for me compared to some of the other ones, um, where that's just a black ink, uh, black acrylic ink printed right over white. Um, but the surfaces on them, you can't quite see it in the videos. They're super built up. They're super thick and they're super heavy, um, which, you know, to me gives them a little more life and texture and a little bit more of my hand in them. Uh, they mm -hmm. read super, super photographic from a distance. But as you get up close, the images kind of break down with the half tone. Uh, and with the texture as well. And we have another one of these images. Um, you can see a little bit of the sort of distressing here in this yep. one um, because of the unevenness of the surface, right? Yeah, yeah, Which... the the surfaces are super, super, super layered. Um, I, I always spend a lot of time on surface preparation and background buildup and sort of build these like layers and histories to the surfaces before I start making the actual images on them. And sometimes I think that's me just kind of spinning my wheels as I'm kind of planning it, but still kind of just painting, even if it's a methodical, meditative, just kind of single color layering um, before I kind of get to the image. But I want them to all have this kind of rich uh, texture and depth and layering to them. And um, there's another one of these that we don't have on the wall Mm -hmm. called I think it's 2423 Lincoln Ave is that what it's yep. called mm -hmm. um so this image has relevance as well yeah uh so that's my mom's house um it's a leaded glass window kind of in her front foyer um I took that image um when I was uh, at home visiting um and I wonder if I should sort of explain all the images uh and they'll kind of make sense together Okay, why don't um, we move on to the dog and okay. you can, but talk about house, window, dogwood, wherever you want to start. Okay, 
Um, yeah, so um, I, I chose these images. Um, I, they're all sort of connected to me. So there's the house, uh, there's the window, there's the dog, uh, there's a statue being removed from the river, and then there's a truck. Um, so the, the overall arching sort of like themes or driving thoughts behind the exhibition, I was, you know, there's a big focus on memory in my practice, mm -hmm. uh, presence, absence, uh, recovery, loss. Um, so I've collected these images, whether they were, you know, things I just kind of came across or things I took myself or something a friend took. Uh, and they were, you know, all images of things that had been sort of like lost and recovered or things that were sort of past their prime, but were still being held on for whatever reason. Uh, and they all felt super um, connected to me in that reason. Um, the, the dog itself. Um, so uh, my, my stepdad passed away a couple months back and kind of in the middle of making this show, but yeah. um, he had, um, he'd been dealing with Alzheimer's early onset Alzheimer's for years. And um, early on, um, actually when him and I did a road trip from Alberta to Toronto, when I moved back here from school, uh, we saw this three legged dog and he stopped and, you know, we were watching this dog and he, told me, you know, um, that the dog kind of quickly recovers and they sort of adapt to their new reality and they don't actually know if there's anything wrong with it. So those of us watching can only see what this dog's lost, but the dog doesn't know any different after a little while. Um, and shortly after he, you know, revealed his uh, diagnosis to me. Um, and I think in that moment, that story was his sort of way of explaining what was happening with him. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, this idea of the three-legged dog is something that stuck with me forever. Um, and it's something that I thought was a nice little way to tie together uh, my thoughts on, you know, memory and all that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, I, you know, I, and having, you know, suffered a loss in the middle of this exhibition, um, I think it would have been easy to kind of lean into that and make this sort of like sad exhibition that sort of reflected on that. But I think in these paintings, I am more focusing on the recovery component of that and the presence component of that um, and creating these things uh, that are about sort of possibility or imagined spaces. Um, so I think the show is much more, even though it's centrally about memory, um, I'm trying to put the focus on looking forward rather than uh, just the sort of reminisce part anyways. Looking forward, resilience. Um, but there's also a, a real strong element of honoring memory in this show. Mm -hmm. I think um, we're going to move on to the um, to Walker Road in just a minute, sure. but which is the other image in the show, right? Yeah. Um, but before we move there, I wonder if while we have um, Garden Gate here and yep. the the dog door here, like these are great, uh, and also search party. Um, uh, Dawn, like these seem like really great opportunities to talk a little bit about your references to the gate and the fence. Sure. Um, and your use of collage. Yeah. So, you know, gates, windows, fences, those are all repeated motifs in my work for sure. Uh, they, you know, these spaces that are often kind of in between one space or another where it's indoor, outdoor, up and down. Uh, so these sort of transitional spaces, they're also, you know, protecting and um, protecting it from something, but also allowing passage. Mm -hmm. um, there are places for reflection. Uh, and then the way in which I organize the windows or the bars um, are often these kind of geometric um, shapes. And each of the kind of shapes becomes a little bit of a container where I can kind of collect little collage components uh, reveal little things um, and sort of organize all these little moments or organize elements from my collage archive. Mm -hmm. So it, it actually provides a structure as well for the works, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, um, you know, the way that um, some of the works are a little more direct acrylic application and some are almost entirely collaged acrylic. It depends on sort of piece to piece. Um, but the ones in which it's more collage heavy, um, you know, it's like filling each one of those areas with an element. Yeah, so that one has a direct application of the yellow paint. And then all of those black, white, gray rectangles uh, are collaged on top of it. So um, can you talk a little bit, Jason, about, because um, when people think of collage, I think they think paper. 
Yeah. And these, these look like they could be paper, but they're all paint. All paint, yeah. So everything is paint on paint, and that's very important to me. Um, and I, I reference a collage archive, but it's a completely self-generated one. Um, so those, um, those bits of paint, like the rectangles that you see there, um, they're all super flat, pretty paper-like, uh, but they're made just out of acrylic paint. So it's a process of um, making these paint skins where I'm working with sheets of plastic and I'm manipulating them, whether it's folding them or creasing them or wrapping them around an object and then painting on top of that. Uh, and the way I'm kind of layering the paint and building it up and building it up feels uh, almost like casting to me in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a, like a straight white paint. Um, and then once I have enough of a surface built up on it, I, um, I paint in the light and shadows and then I peel it off um, just as you would a sheet of paper. And then I um, collect them all. So when I'm so doing this, I, sorry, when you say you, you're painting in um, I, that, that is such a finesse technique, the way you're painting it in and you're simply using carbon black acrylic paint, right? And mm -hmm. an air, an airbrush. Yeah. So I'm, I rarely paint with a brush. Like I'm, you know, the way I lay down all the white, I said I brush it on, but I'm pretty much just squeegees and rollers as I'm trying to not have the sort of texture of the paint tooth. And then, yeah, using, utilizing an airbrush um, to spray in the shadows. Um, and this one uh, is called Search Party Dawn. And I wondered yep. about the relevance of that title because I was, when I was reading some of your process notes, you talked about this airbrushing um, sort of sweep as almost yep. being like light or shadow going across the surface, but also mm -hmm. like brushing for prints. Yeah, oh. I, I've used this sort of term like uh, brushing for fingerprints because, you know, it's this dead sort of flat white surface. And then when you airbrush it across, it's just all of those folds and bits of texture and everything just absolutely comes to life and just kind of jumps right out of it. Uh, it's this, and it happens really quickly um, mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I reference the, you know, different methods of searching or investigating in my work. Like I've, you know, I'll use a power sander and I say it feels like an excavation or, you know, dusting with the airbrush. Um, and I think that's also why I make in so many different ways, because it's like using all of the tools I possibly can to search for something, to investigate something, to figure something out. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, so the search party element of it too, like I was also thinking of, like an investigative, uh, like bulletin board, right? Or um, mm. the detective or something would have a bulletin board with all just different clues and right. uh, notes and photos and everything just pasted up all over the place. Right. Uh, so Absolutely. these organize, it's like almost like these organization of these documents mm. um, all sort of assembled. Awesome. Okay. Um, we're going to uh, move over to Walker Road. Sure. Um, Um, so Walker Road is the other image you talked about, um, yes. and it's the largest painting in the show, but I believe yep. it's also the largest painting you've ever made. Yep, it's the yes. largest painting I've yes. made. Yes. Cool. So we're going to wander over here. So this is, this is Walker Road, and this is a silkscreen like what we saw, the window piece, the... Mm -hmm three-legged dog in yellow and the house in black and white and yellow. Those are all silk screens. So I'd love to hear you talk about the image, but then let's talk about this silk screening technique you're using. Okay. Um, yeah. So the image uh, Walker Road, it was taken um, on Walker Road in Windsor. I see there's a few Windsor people on here. So hello to you. I'm sure some of them have seen this before. Um, and it was something I passed a lot on my way into the city to visit my mom. Uh, and the not for sale, um, it's not an embellishment of the painting. It's not something I worked in there. Like that was something the owner of the truck painted on his own truck. Uh, and I love the idea of this thing that was sort of busted and broken down and past its prime and function. Um, but he just kind of refused to let it go. And in a way went so far as kind of destroying it further so that no one else could have it. Mm. Um, I also, in the way, you know, I don't have all the answers as to what this truck is, 
like I have bits and pieces of it um, and I can kind of imagine the rest. And I, I feel the same way about the house or the statue or the dog. Like it, there's a little bit of a lore behind it where, you know, bits and pieces and everyone kind of has a different take on how it happened and all that stuff. Um, so I, I love that the sort of the history of all of these things is also a little bit blurred. Um, but it felt right at home with, you know, the three legged dog and this thing that had, you know, found new life or, uh, was still holding on, um, mm. despite, um, you know, such a significant change or loss. Um, but yeah, so this, uh, it's 90 inches wide, um, and 60 inches tall. So seven and a half feet by five feet. Uh, it's six, um, separate prints all tiled together, like six different screens come together to make it up. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was an image, um, I had tried to take, uh, on my own and my photo wasn't as great. Um, so I tasked a friend of mine in Windsor who is not a photographer with jo just going back and shooting it for me. Um, and he did so with an iPhone, uh, maybe five years ago. Um, so I've been holding on to this image since. Um, so yeah, it was just a color iPhone photo that, um, you know, converted, uh, into a half tone pattern. Um, so, you know, we could get it silk screened. So I wanted it to have the look of an old photocopy and an old newspaper print using that half tone kind of dot pattern. I didn't mm -hmm. want it to be crisp and clean and perfect. Um, it's tiled together, uh, which feels very much like the way that I work in collage or some of the grid patterns that happen, uh, in the other paintings. And, uh, you know, it's again, like the other one, it's black over white, but it has a crazy amount of paint on that surface that's heavily, heavily textured. There's spots that have hard edge circles, like which I think you can kind of see in that garage door there. Uh, there's spots that have really kind of like rough brushwork and squeegee work. Um, so the ink, uh, the acrylic ink kind of skips in some spots and builds up super, super heavy in others. Yes. Um, so it, you know, again, like that other one, it has this photographic quality from a distance and sort of breaks down the more you get close and the more you spend time with it. Um, and because you've um, added so much texture behind the silk screen, I find myself seeing images within it that aren't there. Mm -hmm. Like it, it starts playing tricks with me. Um, yeah. It just adds a, so much depth into the imagery. Those imperfections. Yeah. 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 And I, um, you know, I think some of it was planned and some of it was sort of a happy accident, um, which is what I love about silk screening, but the, the texture in it uh, very much resembles uh, some of the rust and corrosion happening on the truck. Um, it's still a very sort of like clean painting in many ways, but the way that it's sort of built up, there's almost, um, yeah, there's some grit to it, you know? Um, it, it, I love the way you seem to almost throw obstacles in your own way. You, uh, you know, you're basically dealing with photography, mm -hmm. but it's all paint. Yep. You're using a printmaking technique, but they're all originals. Mm -hmm. And you're collaging, but God forbid you would never use paper. So I, I just, I think that's really, it's intriguing to me. Yeah, I get sort of stuck on sometimes rules or processes or... I get things in my head that I sort of have to make it a certain way and I will set parameters on myself, whether it's a color palette or these are the tools I kind of have to use. I like mm -hmm. trying to find complexities in under limitations or with really simple things. Right. Shall we move on to sure. midnight mountain cabin? Sure. Which is this gorgeous thing here. Um, I'm going to let Mika get closer in. I'm going to wander behind her here so that people joining us can get a great view of this piece. This is really large too. Yeah. So this one is six feet tall or 72 inches by 48. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to make a painting that was sort of my size. Um, something that, you know, you could kind of, you can imagine yourself being able to step through or step into. Mm -hmm. Um it's um it, it's a door but it's also a house <laughs> um and it's very much a window i i i hear from people that this one sort of most evokes like the stained glass thing mm -hmm. um, which isn't always what i set out to do like i'm thinking i'm often thinking more of like a, a an iron gate or a leaded window but i totally invite the stained glass reference like i'm i'm happy that people can if that's your way in i think that's great um 
So yeah, this one combines a ton of the collage skins, um, some direct acrylic application, and as well as silk screen. In the um, in the yeah behind that circle in the top, uh, the house makes an appearance again, and then it appears a few more times in the bottom. Uh, in the bottom, there's a blue rectangle, which to me is the front door of the house, uh, and through the gate of that house, you see uh, the Calgary house in behind. Right. Yes, and there's a there's another there's a the front steps on the right yep. Yep. corner, and then also a little kind of garden off to the right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and that little garden off to the right here, mm -hmm. that's similar to the treatment we saw in Garden Gate, the small one we were looking at. Yes. Can you talk about how you create that imagery? Yeah, it's um, it's just like a, a stenciling, like using real stuff that I find, whether it's like actual plants uh, and fences and just stenciling. Um, I'm, you know, I often think about different means of documentation in my work. Like I referenced um, earlier when I was talking about the truck, you know, photocopies and old textbook or newspapers. Uh, the collage elements look very much like black and white photos or silver gelatin prints. And that little garden there, or the garden gate painting, uh, is definitely my reference to photograms. Um, all of the objects exist in the negative. Um, and then there's, you know, the sort of play of light and shadow. But it, it's, you know, again, just really sort of simple black and white stuff. Um, so but you, liter you literally to... would put a piece of fence up against the painting. Mm -hmm. And then yep. you're, you're putting actual pieces of plant against it and then airbrushing over that. Yeah, there were like dead plants that I found along the train tracks across from my studio. And I, um, I, I can't believe I have a couple of different gates in my studio that I use uh, as stencils and as references. So in these acrylic skins that you make, mm -hmm. um, when we see an actual image, like we saw the house, here we have the dogs, one of the dog's feet. Yep. Um, is that silk screened? Yeah, so um, there, there's the process I talked about of the silk screening, and then there's the paint skins, and then there's a few instances in which I made the paint skins and then silk screened over top of them. So uh, those sort of two processes, uh, which are separate, come together in both kind of collaging over top of one another and then actually um, printing over top of the skins as well. So many layers. And I, I think there's some wonderful examples here of how you actually like stick an object underneath the plastic when you're making the skin yep. to create different shapes and textures. Yeah. Yeah. I have a collection of just, you know, different tools and stuff that I've used to make stencils and creases and all these sort of marks. Um, yeah. So that, that repeated circle motif appears, you know, quite a bit. Um, the circle comes up in my work. I, like it's, you know, what I kind of said about liking really simple things and trying to make them a little more complex or a little more interesting. And then the circle, if I'm talking about presence and absence, it's at once this whole and complete object, but also a perfect void. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like how it's always kind of those two things at once. Um, there's a lot of plays between, you know, presence, absence, and those sort of dichotomies and opposites. And this this piece mm -hmm. has some splashes of color. Yep. The yellow and the blue. Um, was there some uh, reason behind the color choices for you? Yeah, I, I there's a few, I guess. Um, you know, I, I paint primarily in black and white, and that came out of a practical reason because I was making these sort of collage paintings in full color in early on in grad school, but they felt really sort of chaotic. So I told myself I was gonna just make black and white till I sort of figured the compositions out. Mm -hmm. um, I shortly sort of realized that the black and white made a lot of sense with what I was interested in um, at the time, which was more general history and sort of art history and painting history. But I felt like I was making these things that looked like old photos of paintings and I really liked that about it. Um, but I also feel like if you do anything for too long, um, it can get a little stagnant. Um, so, you know, I think what you were sort of saying, like, I like to throw obstacles at myself and color is something I struggled with. So every once in a while, I force myself to introduce it. Um, you know, and sometimes I, um, it's about the specific color is about something. I think there's a lot of references to kind of night and day in these works. Um, 
and then some of the colors are just absolutely gorgeous like that blue is wildly rich and i just absolutely love it it's gorgeous um, and there's two squares a small one here mm -hmm. and one down there that is dangerously close to pink yeah it's this little it's like this little peachy um paint that i have uh, and another sort of color experiment that i had was doing and i printed over it so there's a lot of parts in these paintings that may be like the tiniest little square of, you know, a failed painting or something that um, I've sort of removed and put into something else. Um, all these paintings are kind of remixes of a whole bunch of other different paintings um, that never sort of leave the studio. So I, I really loved that color, um, but the sort of whole image didn't quite work, but I thought I would introduce a couple little things. It um, works really it just, well in this piece just throws it off ever so slightly and it's something mm -hmm. that you don't catch at first glance so I, I like having those moments that the longer you spend time with the work uh, the more things sort of reveal themselves let's move over to search party dusk mm -hmm. which is the big big brother <laughs> yeah of search party dawn um and it's a similar technique but you've you there's something in this one that i don't think exists in the other one these gestures here yeah, so um, I I do a lot of masking in my work, um, and th that's examples of um, using a frisket uh, for masking. It's uh, essentially like a liquid rubber that you can draw or paint with. Um, it's mostly used, I think, or was used a lot in illustration, and is still used, I think, in watercolor. Um, if an area you just don't want the paper to get wet or color on, you could use that to seal it. Mm. Um, I filled up a squeezy bottle with it and mounted a pen tip to it. And I do these kind of gestural drawings with it and then airbrush over it and remove it. So the white only exists in the negative or in the absence. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've used it uh, more in um, other works and um, other pieces in this exhibition or these works, it makes smaller appearances, but just those kind of little moments, um, you know, through all these sort of like, pages or documents in this thing uh and in this one like search party i had mentioned these things being like documents or archives or something and i like that uh they're almost like circled clues mm -hmm. um that are sort right. of scattered amongst all the pages um, um and they're because they they look like hyper real um mm -hmm. objects almost on the canvas this spot right here when I'm looking at it from away, it looks like it's peeling off. Like it, it, it looks like it's coming off of the surface and mm -hmm. it's all part of the image you've created with just the dimensionality of the paint. Yeah, the, you know, I, I, everyone's not gonna be able to have this experience, but uh, like if you run your hands across them, they're pretty darn flat. Yeah, um, very. There, there's a real illusion thing happening with them. Um, mm -hmm. They're, they're, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, methodical about making sure that they're adhered super, super, super flat. Um, and uh, I, I like that sort of like that play between um, depth and surface. Shall we move over to Junkyard Dog? Sure. There's a lot of the frisket on Junkyard Dog. Yes. And also, um, did you do the entire background with the stenciling through the fence first? Yep. Yeah, so this one has the same technique uh, that um, uh, Garden Gate or uh, sort of corner of, excuse me, Mountain Cabin have, uh, where I've just sprayed the surface of the fence um, and have that in the background. Um, I, I did it just sort of as a jumping off point. Um, sometimes I, you know, I almost want to kind of like lay something out that I need to resolve when I don't quite know where I'm headed. Um, so I, I put that fence down on it, you know, a good month or so before I ended up tackling it with anything else. Um, but it, it seemed like this sort of perfect space to have this gate over top of. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really, I'm happy. With, this one is, um, you know, when I talk about windows and gates, this one feels, um, one of the more obvious ones uh, that's a nod to that. This one feels very much like a security window or yeah, like the, you know, the front gate of a junkyard. Um, and I, I say junkyard dog, I mean, it's the reference to the dog that's there. Um, 
it has a really sort of industrial look. And then it's also made from pretty, uh, pretty different uh, techniques and elements and images that all sort of come together to form this thing. I see the truck in a number of instances in this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, um, there's silk screened uh, parts of the truck over top of those acrylic skins. Uh, and then I've also worked the frisket into it. So uh, some of it has the gray scale, some of it doesn't. Um, some, you know, and the ways in which it's uh, layered is pretty different. I think this is also, um, do we have any questions yet, Mika? Are we good? Okay, anytime you, people come up with questions, we're happy to have you interrupt us, okay? Um, this is a great piece, I think, to talk about this, um, well, almost outlining that you do, mm -hmm. which is a last step, I believe. Yep. And um, you're masking off to make these lines. And people can't see it, but it's quite thick. And a lot of them are super textured. So I'm gonna get Mika to come closer and she and you can maybe talk about how you're making some of those variations in those lines. Yeah, sure. So those, um, yeah, the lines I think are the most, they feel like the most painterly thing I do. And they're certainly definitely the, mo the most textured. Um, I, you know, I wanted the surface to be like a leaded window or something. So the collage parts are all really smooth, really flat, almost in the way the glass would be. And then you have these really sort of thick built up bars. Uh, and I wanted them to have the rough sort of aesthetic of like, you know, kind of rough and chunky hand welded things, corroded windows, maybe they're kind of rusted in some spots. Uh, so they're pretty beat up and they're pretty textured. Um, you know, the paint's laid down with some different things. Like I use, um, I think those mostly combs that I used uh, to put the paint down on there, which is why they have those sort of lines all through them. So I think I was mostly painting with combs. Um, and then also I mixed uh, some pumice gel in there, which is like a gritty kind of sandy medium um, and really kind of built it up to almost a cement-like texture in some mm -hmm. spots as well. Um, but the line work's not consistent. It's it's really kind of thick throughout. I guess that's the consistent part, but it's all kind of varied texture all over the thing. The areas where you've used the comb look so much like stitching to me. Like um, they, they begin to look like fabric strips or something. Yeah. I mean, I um, there's a lot of looking at quilts for me as well. Mm. Yes, um, I can see that you know, for like sure. Like the way that, uh, like, uh, you know, especially quilts that are made sort of like from scraps and odds and ends and things like that uh, feels really related to the way in which I make collage. Uh, so I, you know, stitching isn't something that I had thought of, but um, it's certainly in line with, you know, the inspiration that got me here. Yeah. Um, on this piece, mm -hmm. but maybe we'll talk about it. We're going to move over to a window for Georgia. Yeah. There's these sort of cornice corners. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the right word, but let's let's move over there. Yeah. And because um, there's even more of a framing mechanism on that piece. Definitely. And for you, this is uh, an architectural reference. Yeah. So but, the the corner the corners and the the borders are all very much in reference to you know, the trim that would be around a window or a door or whatever that may be. Um, the, the stripes on those and the corners on those are just directly taken from this, the trim in my apartment. Um, you know, I live in a, I think like a 1920s, 1930s building. So it's pretty old, lots of original elements. Um, and I just sort of loved the patterning that was in this place and it totally fit in line with the things I was up to. So um, I just borrowed that from our house. <laughs> <laughs> Which is perfect. Again, yeah. you're, you're using things of meaning to you to create structure and, and, and sort of a, a composition to your work, which is really engaging. Um, uh, yeah. th this one's super playful too, Jason, with what parts you're choosing to silt screen. Yeah. You have a single puppy's eye, but this is probably one of my favorite parts of this whole piece, where you've got this perfect circle with the puppy's snout. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I was saying, like, I think there's a bit of a sad story behind the, you know, the, the work, but, uh, I also have fun with them. Um, and I also think, um, 
they can be funny. I, I like the idea of sort of having funny moments in a painting while also being super serious about them entirely. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I wanted all of the, uh, I see a question. I, 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 um, I wanted the elements uh, or the images to kind of repeat through all the paintings, like little bits of memories or repeated memories or little fragments of something you recalled mm -hmm. um, or little glimpses of snapshots of things. So having this, this dog that sort of appears in almost all of the pieces as this little bouncing ball that goes through the exhibition um, was, you know, just something I was having fun with. Um, um, so do you want, do you want to address the question? Yeah, can you, can, re can uh, you read it out first? Me? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I uh, can't see the screen. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. So uh, someone just asked who's Georgia and uh, Georgia is one of my two dogs. Um, so uh, Georgia just is always, uh, I don't know. She's a sort of guard dog. She's always sort of keeping watch. And because I just took the windows from our apartment, uh, I thought it was a window for Georgia and it's a, but it's an imagined space. It's a made up space. It's a, you know, like a space that I wish we had. Um, but I, it was, I don't know, it was just a little bit of an homage to her and to home um, and to the things I care about, I suppose. Um, and again, sort of a playful title um, and, uh, you know, one that I think sort of suits the piece and one that is um, maybe a little more interesting if you know what it is um, and something just to kind of smile at. You've got, you've got a lot of circles here adding texture mm -hmm. all the way down that, that people can't really necessarily see unless yep. they're really looking. But also this one, for me, while I know, while I see a strong architectural reference, I also feel like um, I'm looking inside of a watch or a clock or something like this. This piece here, like looks yeah. like a gear or something. Um, so yeah, that piece there to me is just, it's a clock. Um, like I, I've, it's got folds in it that sort of extend out to where the circles are. Uh, and it has 12 uh, measured out holes in it. Uh, my And then the circles that you see kind of falling down uh, are the circles I cut out of that piece and then painted mm. over them. So it's like, it's literally like the, the painting falling away mm. uh, in some ways. Uh, my last exhibition um, at uh, Birch Contemporary here in Toronto, my last solo show, which was late 2019, uh, was titled Drawing Clocks. Uh, and in that exhibition, that Drawing Clocks was based on uh, an exercise that they do with uh, people who have or potentially have Alzheimer's where you have to draw a clock. Uh, how much it's used anymore is debatable. But um, so at, in that show, I was using, um, looking at drawing exercises and pattern recognition tests uh, to talk about memory. Um, so that clock that appears in that is sort of a nod to that stuff. Mm-hmm. These are just so incredible. And they're, they're just, you were going through a lot when you were making these. And mm -hmm. you've got, I don't know, a brain the size of the continent of Africa. So um, there's just such a lot going on, but then all of these layers of meaning. But what I like about them is, I mean, we can talk about them and people can look at them and they can hear what you have to say about them and mm -hmm. what I have to say about them. But if, if someone came in here blind, and didn't know you, didn't know your work, and I didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's just so many entry points into these pieces that people could draw their own meaning from. Mm -hmm. um, they're just really quite magical. So thank you. Th yeah, I, yeah, I, I want to, you. you know, I think I want to strike a balance between them being formally and aesthetically interesting while also um, being about something or meaning something to me, you know? Um, I think that's really important to, yeah, visually challenge myself, but also conceptually challenge as well. Yes. Um, and, you know, this is an instance where we have a little more of an opportunity to kind of tease all those things out and talk about all those things. But if, you know, you're not able to talk with me for half an hour, I still want you to be able to get something out of them at the same time. And you will, even if you just leave with tons of questions because you wonder how the hell they're made, which which my experience so far with people coming in and seeing the exhibition, um, which we're thankful we're able to be open. In mm -hmm. fact, we, we've been able to be open consistently since the middle of June, and we're very grateful about that. We've had to wear masks. We've had to control capacity. And of course, we're not doing events, but um, people have been coming in. And, 
and they walk around, they look and they look puzzled. And ultimately I get, how is this made? Like, that is the question. Like they just don't, is this collage? Mm -hmm. Is this like, what, is this a photo transfer? Like this is all of these questions for people. Well, let's pop over and take a look at study for um, Jazz Mountain. Sure. It's the last piece um, in the exhibition that's hung. As you know, there are more, and we couldn't fit them all. <laughs> fit them uh, all up. Yes, um, I make a lot. <laughs> so maybe I'll just well before before we talk about study for Jazz Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, there are an additional. I'm trying to remember how many at least. There's, Six I made 15 total. Of these, the 24 by 30s? Yes. So for anyone watching who wants to see those works, um, what I would suggest you do is go to vivianart.com. Vivianart.com is our website. And there's a link in the menu for our store. And it's free to look. <laughs> um, it's every single piece is on there. And if you click on the image of the piece, it'll give you a larger image. So if you want to look through and see um, what's not up on the wall in the show, that's probably the best way to, uh, to look at them. Um, and if you see something marked sold and you really, really want it, email us because we can't put things on the store on hold. So that may be an item on hold. So reach out. Um, so this piece, it has a similar treatment to... Um, to the um, the search party pieces, yes? Yes, yeah. Um, uh, but way more texture and um, and talk about the shape. Yeah, so uh, this is a mountain painting to me uh, in the same way that Garden Gate is like the closest I'm gonna probably get to painting flowers and plants. This is probably the closest I'm gonna get to making a landscape painting. Uh, but yeah, the way that I was sort of organizing these pieces uh, felt very much like a mountain. Uh, I was laying them out and they were kind of going up uh, and it felt like a mountain. And, you know, thinking about my time in Calgary and Banff and I, I thought it would be a nice way to sort of pay an homage there. So it's the same sort of, um, you know, technique and application and organization as the search party pieces, but with a little more negative space, uh, as well as this unifying black laid over top of them. Um, that kind of brings in this mountain form. Uh, the black has that same sort of textured sandy medium mixed through it. Um, so it's, you know, it's like sand or rock or cement when you see it. Um, you can see hints of it on the screen, but it's something that I think you almost need to see in person. And in the right light, you'll get a little bit of a shimmer off of it on a right angle as well. Yeah, um, it, it's super gritty when you're here looking at it in person. And, I, you know, I was, it's, and it's definitely one of those sort of imagined spaces or those future spaces uh, because it's, you know, it's a mountain, but it also sort of reads like a building and it has windows and mountains don't really have windows, but, you know, maybe they're caves or hideaways or portals. And, um, and then the, um, you know, because I think a few of these paintings kind of have jokes in them. Um, this one does as well. Like, um, I I took the color scheme from the background from Utah Jazz basketball jersey. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Jazz Mountain. Uh, so it's a bit of a joke, uh, but it's also, um, you know, a study for it. It's an imagined space. Um, and it's sort of imagining about this future mountain. And uh, yeah, it, it's a fun one. Um, I, I feel like I've, I've made it a little bit silly by revealing that basketball reference, but yeah. Um, um, uh, you're you're a man obsessed when it comes to basketball. It's got to make its way in somewhere. <laughs> that's, maybe that's what all those circles are about. Maybe. I mean, I've <laughs> I, I, I've I've pulled it off where I've made an exhibition that's about a dog and basketball references. So I feel pretty good about it. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, and uh, I mean, I know this about you. Most of the people watching probably know this about you, but didn't you propose to your lovely fiance at center court at a Raptors game? Uh, it was the free throw line, but yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah. I proposed the uh, Christmas day, uh, 2019, uh, yes. at the Raptors game. Yes. That's so cool. Um, and I yeah. loved watching it on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we've gone all the way around the exhibition. Um, mm -hmm. I, wanted, I wanted to just give a nod to Alex Burke. 
Um, am I the only person in the world who calls him Alex instead of Al? I say Alex. Do you? Um, yeah. And that's how we met. We met yes. at the, the Papier Art Fair in um, 2019, which is the last mm -hmm. time that Papier had an art fair in person because of COVID. And yeah. I had a bunch of Alex's um, gorgeous gouache paintings there. Mm -hmm. And um, he went out of his way to introduce me to you. And then after he came back to me and told me that I absolutely had to do a studio visit because you were a god. So uh, um, Alex how... is uh, such a, a sweet, sweet person. And he's been a friend uh, since he came to my grad school show in 2014. Uh, and he is genuinely one of the kindest people I know. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. And as am I. So I did a studio visit the next month, basically, right? It was May. Mm -hmm. It was pretty quick, um, yeah. That I was in Toronto and did a studio visit with you. And that was a treat, too. So, um, and then, you know, between then and now, all of this COVID stuff happened. So I really appreciate the trust that you've had and the faith you've had in us to uh, proceed with this exhibition when we mm -hmm. co you can't be here in person. I couldn't be there again in person. Um, mm -hmm. It's been um, it's been an interesting Zoom relationship we've developed, actually. Yeah, you, me, you, me, uh, and Mika. Yeah, it's it's been really great, and I'm I'm super grateful for you know of both the opportunity and the support. Um, it's been really great. Um, yeah, I mean, um, you know, Alex has shown with you, and uh, to shout out another friend, um, I'm very good friends with Scott Everingham as well, who mm -hmm. is another wildly talented painter that you show. Um, so I knew I was uh, in good hands, um, even though I couldn't be there. Yes. And um, we're going to watch, we're going to watch public health and whether things open up at all. I'm not feeling particularly optimistic right now, but I would love to have you here before the end of the show, but we'll just play that by ear and not have yes. our hopes too high. Um, but that would be great. It would be yes. really lovely to see you in person again. And, more importantly, really great to have you here in the space and have some of these wonderful people in Calgary that you developed relationships with have the opportunity to come in and experience your work with you. Yeah, I, yeah. that would be, that'd be really great. I, um, there's a lot of old faces and friends that I miss. Um, and, you know, I'd love to, these things only existed in my studio, so I'd love to see them, you know, sort of in a gallery space. Yes, so let's hope. But in the meantime, we will have a virtual tour up soon, which I know is not the same, but we will have a full virtual tour of the exhibition up. Um, I'm going to get Mika to do one more slow walk around. Uh, how mm -hmm. many minutes do we have left, Mika? Eight minutes. We have eight minutes. She's going to go back around the show for anyone who wants to revisit anything. And watch, she's going to watch for um, questions as she goes. Um, so if anyone yeah, has please, questions. Yeah, uh, please lob questions at me if you have any at all, or if I glossed over something, uh, which I'm known to do. If it's something I'm super familiar with, I don't always unpack it enough. I don't know. I, one of the things that we didn't talk about when we looked at Garden Gate before, you know I'm obsessed mm -hmm. with this piece is um, all of these little pieces of scotch tape, which I really yeah. adore, by the way. I love the little pieces of scotch tape and that you left them be part of the stencil. Yep. Um, I think I told you Chris Cran came in to see the show. I don't know if he did, but I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Absolutely loved it and called you Great. bastard about three times. Um, <laughs> So, which is the highest of compliments, I have to tell you. I was going to say, I don't know him, so I hope that's, I hope that's a compliment. Yeah, it's a it's very great. high compliment. It's like, shit, how did he do that? <laughs> um, um, he I've really been, enjoyed uh, the show. That's great. And that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's a lovely way to hear. I mean, he's, uh, he's one of, you know, he's been around forever, and he's got such an extensive career. So that's really lovely to hear. And I think I've mentioned to you before, there's so many crossovers in your practice. I, I wrote an article about his work when I was in third year at ACAD, maybe fourth. And um, he was one of my teachers. Uh, and he, he references photography For sure, really, yeah. really strongly in his work. And he also has a body of abstract paintings 
where the entire framing device of the core image is that kind of yellow that you're using. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of interesting. I went back and looked through his book the morning after we installed this show. I was just like, I, I have to look at this work again because it's just, I don't know, there's lots of really nice crossovers. I'm sure he'll be back. His studio is just down the street. Yes. Um, and I'm sure that if, uh, if you ever get here, he would love to see you in his studio. Right. Yeah. So the Vivian Art Store is live. It's sad that you can't all be here, but um, some of you can. Some of you are probably in Calgary. Come see us. Um, for those of you that aren't, take a look at the store, and um, we'd be happy to help you out if there's anything you really want to have. Um, this is a really great show, Jason. I'm just really proud of this work. And um, we're, on, we're in such a busy neighborhood now, and we're finally getting a break in the weather and um, excited to see just how many people are getting in to see it for real. Yeah, I'm, um, I, I'm very pleased to hear that people are able to have the opportunity to go out and see it. Mm -hmm. uh, things have been definitely more restricted here. We've only just, um, you know, in the last month or less even been able to go see galleries um, and even then it's pretty limited so um, I'm happy that folks can uh, walk over and see my stuff um, when I'm not able to. Yeah and I mean I, I think it feels really safe for people in here. The ceilings are 17 feet high and um, now that it's been milder out the door is usually propped open and everyone's wearing masks. Uh, no one has to touch anything um, so it's just uh, it feels like a safe space. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, I think we're wrapping up. I think we're in our last couple minutes. Sure. Yeah. Um, is there anything, last things you want to say, Jason? Uh, I think I covered it. Um, but if anyone um, has any other questions um, or wants to know anything about the work, um, feel free to shoot me a message, um, a DM or whatever. I'm, I'm happy to chat about it. Um, I miss not being able to hang out in the gallery and have those conversations one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so I'm happy to do that if anyone's interested. Um, or, you know, talk to Vivian and she can answer them as well. But um, don't be shy. I'd love to chat with anyone. Um, yes, yes, um, as would we. And thank you to all of you who joined us for this live tonight. Time is still precious, even though maybe some, sometimes it feels like we have too much on our hands these days, too much time. Um, but it's precious, and we appreciate you sharing uh, in this experience with us uh, and for raising a glass with us early on in our conversation. And um, we uh, hope we get to see some of you in person really soon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.